Hello and good evening. My name is Charlotte Potter Kasich and I am the executive director here at the Barry Art Museum. The Barry Art Museum is located at Old Dominion University on our campus in Norfolk, Virginia. We were founded by art collectors, Richard and Carolyn Barry. We opened our doors to the public in November of 2018. Now here for a little bit of a look inside, our collection has uh, remarkable pairings that uh, sort of transcend time and medium to show parallels that are happening um, through pattern and color and texture. So here's a little glimpse inside. And here's one particular pairing I love so much by Flora Mace and, Kirk and Joey Kirkpatrick, uh, a still life, juxtaposed by this beautiful Alfred Morrow. We have a remarkable marine painting collection and probably um, our most unique component of our collection is the historic dolls and automata, automata or automata. This evening's lecture is building off the momentum of a changing exhibition that's currently on view up through December 31st of 2022. It's called Motion Emotion, Exploring Affect from Automata to Robots, and it was guest curated by Sarah Woodbury. The exhibition investigates the emotional qualities of automata and robots. It features selections from our permanent collection as well as works by contemporary artists and other leading institutions. But really it's exploring the intersection between art, science and emotion. Um, it unpacks our own collection as well as allows you to kind of go on an emotional journey through time. Um, we wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors for this evening's lecture. It's presented by the George and Grace Dragas Family Foundation and the Dragas Companies with support, support from Susan and David Good. Thank you. So this evening um, is a lecture that's titled, How They Moved, How They Sounded. It's jointly hosted by the Barry Art Museum and the Morris Museum, which is in Morristown, New Jersey. And it's a conversation between Richmond-based artist, Elizabeth King, who is one of our featured contemporary artists in the exhibit, and Jer Ryder, who is the Guinness Collection, Collection Conservator at the Morris Museum. Um, you'll learn a lot more about both of these over the course of this evening, but Ryder's devoted his life to the research and conservation of historical automata and clockwork and music machines from around the world. And King, whose sculpture and filmmaking has been influenced by her interest in puppets and automata, has just finished a monograph on the 16th century automata of a, of a friar in the collection of the Smithsonian Institute to be published in 2023 by Getty Publications. Together, they're gonna to present a choice examples of um, artificial life from clockwork, sphere, and take views behind the scenes for a bit of shop talk about their work with these unique objects. Um, we wanna thank the Office of Community Engagement this evening for allowing this webinar to happen. So Elizabeth King, um, Elizabeth King taught at uh, VCU for many years and she's probably known best for her incredible attention to detail. You'll see from the objects that we show this evening how she's really controlling every, every portion of her um, installations. They're wonderfully uncanny, unnerving, and just downright um, beautiful. Um, so you'll hear some more from her shortly. And now I'm going to stop sharing just really quickly. And I'm gonna pull up a special video that's going to help uh, tee up the content for this evening. Give me two seconds while I do this, cause I'm toggling. Oops, hold on. I practiced this and thought I was gonna be so swift at that. Give me two more seconds, everyone. Sorry about that. Okie dokie. I am optimizing. Okay, we're gonna show. Here we go. Yay, how about that? that something from the late 1700s wow. could captivate today's youth seems as miraculous as the device itself. This elaborate wind-up machine called an automaton, which writes and draws, is in many ways a mystery, even centuries later. The more you watch it, the more you realize how little you actually know. We are winding the spring up. Just like you'd wind up a clock. Yeah. 
Charles Peniman, the caretaker of this automaton at Philadelphia's Franklin Institute, explains that back when automata were built, trade secrets were common and were lost when the artisan died. This automaton had been damaged in a fire and was in pieces when the museum received it back in 1928. Senior scientist Derek Pitt says it was like putting together a puzzle. Did you know it was an automaton? We had some idea that it was some sort of mechanical automatic device, but we had no real idea of its true nature until a machinist working here at the Franklin Institute decided to put it all together. Once reassembled, the hands of this remarkable boy machine could be moved by a series of levers, guided by precisely carved grooves in brass discs called cams. Not only could it draw four different pictures, including a Chinese temple and a ship, but it could write poems, one in English, two in French, solving a mystery. It wrote out, essentially, this device was created by Mayar Day. And that told us who the maker was. And from there, we could find out the history of the device. Hundreds of years ago, automata were created by watchmakers, almost as a way to brag and show off their abilities. When clocks were invented and people saw that you can use these mechanics to create a man that could juggle or sing or be on a trapeze, it sort of started people thinking like, what is life? If something can mimic the act of life, why isn't it itself alive? So this is my draw with all of my uh, Hugo sketches. Author Brian Selznick was fascinated by the device and dreamed up a now famous children's book centered around an automaton. For research, he went to see the one in Philadelphia. I imagined a kid climbing through the garbage and finding one of those broken machines and trying to fix it. And that boy became Hugo, and that's where the whole story really began. Selznick's story became a 500-page tale that doesn't look or read like a typical children's book. Much of it unfolds in a series of pencil and ink drawings that Selznick created in the studio of his Brooklyn apartment. His best-selling book, The Invention of Hugo Cabré... What is that? It's an automaton. ...was turned into the movie Hugo, which earned 11 Oscar nominations. So this is the very first uh, sketch that I had for the metal grate that uh, ended up being built for the movie. In the story, Hugo lives behind the grates of a 1930s Paris train station. He hopes that fixing his automaton will reveal an important message, just as it did with Meyer Days. Have you seen increased interest in automata since the movie, Hugo? Um, yes, we have. Uh, Jerry Ryder maintains this collection of automata at the Morris Museum in New Jersey. And in the late 1700s, it was one of the most fascinating times with the most complex pieces. The museum has around 120 automata from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And once he starts, he sort of teases the pig with a truffle. Ryder demonstrates one called the pig and the peasant, where everything from the toes of the peasant to the pig's tongue moves. They were adult luxuries meant to be a decorative art in your home, which they still are today with some collectors. The machines were even used by magicians. He's actually been performing the same illusion for uh, just about 100 years now. <laughs> Doesn't get old, huh? Ooh, so he's lost his head. And the head appears. In the fantastic world of automaton, Derek Pitts says Meyer Days stands out. There had been a number of automata made, but none of this caliber. This represents the pinnacle of this kind of work. They are rare curiosities to be had, and we're fortunate to have one here. A rare old-fashioned curiosity, finding a modern day rebirth. Wonderful.
Now I'm going to continue our presentation. That was fascinating. I'd never watched that before. And I think it's the perfect introduction to this evening's talk because um, it really starts, sort of sets up where my own fascination from um, about Automata came from, which is that movie. And uh, it's really incredible. I didn't know that it was inspired by that particular piece. Okay, jumping back in here. Okay, so joining us this evening, we have Andrew Sandahl, who is the um, newly minted president and CEO of the Morris Museum. He's been there for three months. Previously, he was the executive director of the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, he's here to tell us a little bit about the Morris Museum and to give some context to um, Jer and, and uh, their beautiful collection here that you can see. Good evening. Good evening, Andrew. Welcome. Well, thank you, Charlotte, for the invitation to be here tonight and to speak a little about the Morris Museum. I recently joined as the new executive director, and now I'm almost three months into the role. I'm slowly learning the building and the collections, at the center of which, both physically and spiritually, is the wonderful Murta D. Guinness collection. This world-class collection includes over 750 examples of mechanical musical instruments and automata, and 5,000 pieces of programmed media, such as player piano rolls and pin cylinders for music boxes, dating from the 16th century right up to the early 20th century. Awarded to the museum in 2003 after the passing of its collector, since 2007, this collection has resided in a purpose-built 5,000 square foot exhibit space at the heart of the museum, with over 150 pieces on permanent display, and many others making regular appearances in temporary exhibits or demonstrations. As the museum evolves and grows, including becoming No Jersey's only Smithsonian affiliate in 2019, and now hosting, hosting one of only 10 Smithsonian Spark Lab interactive learning and invention centers in the country, the Guinness Collection remains a key element of what we do and has driven the museum's new vision of focusing on exhibits and programs that look at the world through the lenses of art, sound and motion. Central to everything we do here is our wonderful conservator, Jer Ryder. Having been at the Morris Museum for over 18 years now, it's fair to say that Jer has become the face of the Guinness Collection, thanks to his many exhibits, programs, as you just saw, TV appearances, and regular demonstrations of the objects on display. But this represents just a fraction of the work to keep the collection in good shape, and in many cases in working condition that he undertakes. I really don't think in my time at the museum, I've learned I really think I've learned that it wouldn't be a stretch if we changed his job title to the museum magician, given the miracles he's able to work. And it's my pleasure to be able to share him with you tonight and his amazing talents as one of your speakers for this program. Welcome. I thank you very much for that introduction, Andrew. Uh, uh, very much appreciated. Um, one of sort of the, the questions that I usually get uh, along the way in doing live demonstrations here at the museum is uh, how did I possibly, uh, um, you know, just get involved in mechanical music or automata. And um, it, it comes at a, a very early age, you might say. Uh, once uh, Elizabeth starts uh, the, the PowerPoint program, I think it'll become uh, obviously apparent where the where the start or the the lack of fear you might say uh entered uh, my life of uh and and entrance into the mechanical music and automata world um our discussion tonight or uh talk is how they moved how they sounded and um this is uh, a slide of where where it began for me and my brother uh, I'm the gentleman there on your right hand side as you're viewing this picture with a screwdriver a little bit more sizable than the size of my head at the time, but uh, very enthusiastically going at that little music box to uh, take it to pieces. Um, Tom, you, want, you may wonder, well, if we're talking about figural or human form automata, why am I bringing a, a music box into this or mechanical music? And it because it's basically because uh, automata, the definition of automata doesn't necessarily uh, have to be contained to human or animal uh, figures, representations. Uh, an automata basically is a, a device, a machine that can uh, uh, repeat performances and repeat its performance or actions. Uh, 
um, via coating, whether it's pins in a cylinder, uh, pins in a barrel, uh, uh, perforations and projections on a rotating disc, or whether it's cams, as you just saw in the, the video of the Mayerde Automaton um, that is uh, uh, one of the prized possessions at the uh, Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Um, so th this basically is where it started for me uh, at about two years old, uh, not having a fear of taking something apart. <laughs> um, if we move on, it goes all the way up to the newest acquisition uh, or addition to the Morris Museum, the Duffner Orchestrion. This is about 10 and a half foot tall, uh, Salon Barrel Orchestrion. And as you see, I'm opening up the upper and lower portions of the cabinet of this instrument. Um, and on the lower portion of the instrument, you can see the bellows or leather covered bellows that actually provide the air pressure necessary to play the over hundred organ pipes of different varieties that are inside this instrument. Um, this, this was made, it, it's a very rare American instrument made in Buffalo, New York, about 1876. And that was an abbreviated clip because once that instrument, once you start it, it plays for a full seven minutes of whatever that musical arrangement is, whether it's an overture, an aria, uh, sacred music, popular music of the day, every barrel is pinned with different tunes. Um, so it's, it's an, um, going from extreme from a small tabletop or almost a music box you could hold in your hand all the way up to these huge orchestrions um, that would provide in-home musical entertainment. Uh, this particular one would have been in a very wealthy residence uh, in order to provide the family with classical music or music anytime they wanted it on demand. Moving forward. This is a piece that is at the Barry Museum that I was contracted to design and, and build um, as a demonstration model. Uh, something that could be in the museum to actually show what the hidden, in, hidden mechanism is inside of an automaton. Almost every automaton in a human or uh, animal form will have a spring-driven clockwork motor cams which dictate what the animations of that piece are going to be and repeat themselves time after time again. Here you see a little bit of the mechanism inside of the head to make the eyes shift from side to side. The mechanism down below incorporates a rouge musical movement that's driven by the automaton motor and cams. There are three large cams that operate the arm movements, the tray, the arm with the teapot, and the lifting as well as rotating. And then two cams smaller that turn at a higher RPM on the other, on this side that it's focusing on that actually make the head turn as well as the, um, the eyes shift from side to side. And then here at the museum, we have a beautiful Pierrot automaton by Gustave Vichy, uh, very late 1800s, about 18, 1890 approximately when it was made, 1885, 1890. And this fellow, we had him in the shop here 
uh, for costume conservation work by a textile conservation person and uh, a technician. Well, that was happening. I was able to go through the mechanism and do some maintenance and treatment, conservation treatment to the interior mechanism, the music. Here you can see the, the cams, the animation that's created is to imitate the writing that uh, would have been happening. He's supposedly writing a poem, Pierrot writing a poem to his long love, uh, Columbine, after the, uh, the famous uh, trio, the Comédie de l'Arte trio uh, figures. Hidden inside of the paper mache torso is the music as well as all the mechanism, the clockwork motor, the animation plaque, all this to create this beautiful sort of almost illusion of this romantic character that when he's completely assembled, clothed, costumed, and the lights dimmed low in the room, the light is meant to light, you, you light the actual oil lamp and the wick automatically by the cams dips down to darken as he falls asleep. And then once he wakes up, he reaches over and automatically the wick in the oil lamp is pushed up so he can see what he's writing again and continues to write his love letter to Columbine. There are several of these uh, Piero Ecrivain Automata by Gusta Vichy that exist out there. They were very popular, but to our knowledge, this is one of the only ones that still retains most of its original costuming, which is why we, we really wanted to have the costume preserved for historical sense and posterity. And a few years ago, before the pandemic, uh, we had a Tamata convention uh, here. It's called a Tamata Con. And uh, we had the host of the first one in 2016, the second in 2018, where a very early automaton by von Kempelen uh, from the Netherlands uh, made its visit here to the museum um, during that convention and stayed here for about a month before moving on to a, a larger exhibit at the Spielklok Museum that's located in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, this is owned by a private collector in California, John Gaughan, very famous uh, creator and designer of magic, um, magic automata and magic uh, tricks, you might say, uh, illusions that are created on stage by magicians. And he collects some of these very rare pieces uh, and has a beautiful collection of automata as well as magic paraphernalia out in Los Angeles. Uh, but this, this was a real uh, a coup and honor to have visit here at the museum on its way going to Europe. And Jer, it, it really plays the clarinet, does it not? It well, sadly, in the previous owner, the clarinet, the original clarinet to this piece was lost and has never been refound again. So that's a, um, an approximation, a replacement and approximation. But yes, he was, he will, if he had his original instrument, it was meant to play the, the real clarinet instrument that was meant for him. Uh, in the original advertising, it was also supposed to be uh, play a different instrument. The operator, the owner operator of the piece back in the early 1800s would remove the clarinet and put a cornet in his hands. And he would actually play the cornet, which of course does not have any keys. So he has a very unique reed system inside of his chest that would have sort of um, in a false manner play the cornet. Um, you know, through the air, through the channels, through the different reed notes in his chest in the bellows assembly. So it was meant to really fool people and play both instruments at will. And say the date again, say the date of its making. Oh, this is von Kempelen, and I, uh, the date escapes me exactly, but I'd say about 1826, eight, 1820s, okay. right in that okay. range. It's a very early piece. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump in here and um, introduce myself, Elizabeth King, and say how much I agree with Andy that that Jer Ryder is a magician and not not just someone who knows these automata and who has 
repaired them and worked with them, but has also made mechanisms from scratch of, of his own invention, as, as we saw with that beautiful little demo model that greets the viewers to the show at, that's at the Barry Museum right now. Really a pleasure to, to be on the screen with Jay Ryder. And I, I thought that before I showed a few things of my own, I would add one more 19th century figure to um, the Piero and to um, the kinds of things that you might see um, in the Barry's collection. This is, um, this is a laughing automaton in the um, Musée de, de l'Automate in Souillac in southwestern France. I saw this years ago and found, just found this image on the web. Unfortunately, it doesn't have sound, but um, you can imagine it's a very loud and noisy and fabulous laugh. And it, you know, there's a motion detector. And as you approach, it just bursts into laughter. And it's, I have no idea how they do it, but it's one of my favorite of the, of the 19th century figures. A few images of my own work here, just, just to introduce myself. Um, here is a little puppet. Uh, it's about seven inches tall. It's made of latex. I made this a long time ago. Inside the head is a mechanism that makes her jaw move. So she chews a little bit like chewing gum. And she stands in this closet on a little miniature stage in a tiny theater. And you'll notice that there's a line here, the theater, hinges open and is mounted on either side of a chair. And I expect my viewer to sit in the chair and, and close this miniature theater around their head. Whereas if about 30 seconds goes by, and that's a long time, time to wait, but about 30 seconds goes by, um, that closet door opens and the puppet greets, greets my viewer. Um, here's one half of the theater. You see there's a little mirror here and the puppet looks at the viewer through that mirror. Many, many years and many puppets and figures later, this is a um, piece called Pupil. Um, I've, gotten, I've gotten good at building movable and jointed figures. This is about half-life size. It's made of porcelain with movable glass eyes and a jointed wooden body. Um, it's a piece that would assume that I wanted to have assume different poses in space. I would show it from one show to the next pose differently. And a year or so after I finished it, I, I got a kind of amazing chance to animate it with stop motion animation, working with my friend Richard Kizu Blair, who at that time was a director at Colossal Pictures, which was a special effects studio in San Francisco. Um, we've been looking at stop motion works by the brothers Quay and Jan Slonkmeyer and um, Colossal was a wonderful clearinghouse where all kinds of animators and directors passed through doing experimental works and they did a short film with this piece. Um, I'll show it. Um, it's about, it's maybe a, a little less than a minute long and this clip of the film um, comes from a documentary on my work by Olympia Stone, a documentary called Double Take, and it has a soundtrack by Fred Story that I love. Um, the animation itself is on view in the Barry Museum show. This is a little bit of a new way to see it.
So a sculpture and its animation. So I don't make automata, but I make movable sculptures and set them in motion with stop motion film. Um, here's a little model of an eye that I made. This is life size. I made it in conjunction with an ocularist, um, one who makes artificial human eyes. He made the eye. I made the movable lids and the moving part inside the eye in the orbit. And um, here's a very short little animation of it. Um, another piece, this is a, a carved and jointed boxwood hand, about half life size, um, an animation of it. And this animation is part of a longer piece um, that was, that I made with animator Peter Dodd, a wonderful Danish animator who was known on the on the set of Tim Burton's Corpse Bride as the hands guy. I met him. He animated the hand, made about a four minute beautiful animation of it in London. And here I'm showing it with the original sculpture. Um, we took that animation, we flipped it so it would look like the mating hand. And then I displayed it on a little screen on a pedestal and lit the sculpture exactly as we had it lit in the film studio. Um, so if you approach the vitrine, you would see a pair of hands looking very similar, one a sculpture, one a film. Um, I was intrigued to see if I could bridge that gap, if I could put a pair of hands up in space, speaking the language of film in the one case and sculpture in the other. Um, and what I can't show here is what it looks like when you walk back and forth past this and see the parallax between the little space between these two hands. Um, I finally made the second hand. Um, again, English boxwood, jointed and posable. I'm especially proud of those thumb joints because they permit the hands to have the opposable thumb and they permit the hands to move in a full and um, emotionally rich way. Um, here's another animator. I'm working here with um, Mike Belzer, who's based in Seattle, I asked him if he would be willing to come and animate this pair of hands in a gallery show, which I had at Mass Mocha up in North Adams, Massachusetts, just a couple of years ago. He said, yes, um, I made him wear gloves because one hand belongs to a collector. We had to not get, we had to not get it dirty. And Mike was willing to do this. Um, and so for two weeks at Mass Mocha, um, they built us a beautiful film set in the gallery. People could come in and watch us working. The stage has been mounted on gimbal, so it's vibration proof, which was an extraordinary um, accomplishment for the fabrication crew at Mass Mocha. And I'll show you, we, we did a time lapse of ourselves working over two weeks. Um, and I'll just show you quick clips of it. Um, but what's fun here is, here's pupil, which I just showed you. You're gonna see it zooming by, the video that you saw zooming by on this screen. Here's Mike, he's animating two hands. And if you look carefully, you'll see, if you keep your eye on this part, you'll see time-lapse showing stop frame, two really different temporal spheres in the, in the film world. I always get a kick out of seeing this. And then here's another quick clip of what it looks like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, here's a, one of the pieces that we shot in the gallery. We shot a series of, of eight or nine little episodes that I've put together. You can see it on my website, um, Faints and Slights, it's called. And then finally, one more piece. I've animated this, but I'd like to animate it again. Um, it has a very effective and excellent neck. Um, and so I've made a few tests, but I'm waiting for the right chance to, um, to, to set it in motion. And then just, you know, Jer showed a picture of himself taking a music box apart as a three-year-old. And so I thought I would also mention my own start. I think part of my fascination with the body and the way it moves and, and the incredible sophistication that we all have for reading body language comes from um, my childhood with a mother who was paralyzed from the waist down with polio. And this is a picture of her still in quarantine. This was the year before the vaccine. She's buying some postage, she's sending some letters. She's got her brand new crutches on. 
um, braces on and crutches. And, you know, years later, I found this photo and just was blown away at how similar my portrait was of her, which I didn't finish until after she passed away. Um, she lived for 30 years and brought up three kids and her animation and charisma really, really got in my blood. I think, you know, for me, it was just completely normal that I had this fabulous mother surrounded by all these wonderful compensatory mechanical devices and somehow it, it, it got in my blood. So, all right, so now you've seen a little bit about Jair and a little bit about me. And what we want to do next is we want to, and you've seen a few 19th century automata, and of course the Barry is filled with an extraordinary show of 19th century automata, but now we want to go back in time. And so we're going to go back to the Maillard day. I'm going to turn it back over to Jair, and he'll talk a little bit about a number of extraordinary enlightenment automata. And then when he's finished, I'll jump back in and I'll show you a few um, automata from the Renaissance. I've, I've been sort of uh, in the in the past oh, 10 years honored to uh, have been called down to the Franklin Institute to study with both uh, um, Mr. Penniman before he passed away, as well as um, uh, Andrew Barron, who was a technician who worked for quite a number of years with the Meyer Day writer um, to maintain it over the years. Um, it had traveled to a few exhibits. Uh, very far away, uh, traveling uh, locations, uh, which they were very hesitant to loan it to. And each time it came back, it needed a little bit of tender, loving care in order to get back in order again. Uh, it really, it, even though it's a massive construction of brass and steel, uh, it, it still is an extremely delicate instrument um, for as massive a piece that it actually looks like. Uh, there, there's no way that one person or even two can lift this up and move it. Uh, they usually have a small, uh, almost a, a pallet jack in order to lift it up. Uh, four people, one at each corner would have difficulty lifting it up. The mechanism is so massive. Um, but the, you know, it dates, uh, Henri Meyer Day had made it. It dates from about 1810, approximately. Uh, and the interesting thing about Meyer Day was he was actually employed by Jacques Hedreau, and he had seen the earlier three pieces that uh, Elizabeth will uh, talk about very shortly, um, or and, and myself. But the Meyer Day piece, he what he did is uh, about 40 years later, he decided to make one automaton and incorporate aspects of the two Jacques Hedreau extraordinary pieces into one. And that's why you've got a writer and an artsman, uh, a draftsman, all in one automaton. Um, and in that earlier depiction you just saw, I think that dates from about 1826 at the uh, Gothic um, Hall uh, in Haymarket in London, uh, where that piece, the Meyer Day writer, is all the way over on your right hand side. Uh, and it's displayed along with a few other uh, pieces, including a magician just uh, behind to the left of the, uh, the uh, military gentleman there with the, the, um, the helmet on. There's a magician just, uh, just to your right, no, just to the right there. And um, that piece is in a museum. It still exists today in uh, Le Loc, in uh, a clock and watch museum in Le Loc, Switzerland. Uh, and that's a beautiful, uh, uh, almost a fortune telling wizard type magician piece. So it shows you a little bit of the context of where these things were displayed and how they were prized at that time uh, when they were amazed. They drew large amounts of crowds to see them in action. This is a photograph down at the mechanism uh, with the glass removed and the body, most of the body removed of the figure. And you can see this massive stack of cams with three different cam riders. There's an X, uh, three different sets, you might say, of cams. So they're, the three cam riders are basically X, Y, and Z um, components, uh, directional components, left, right, forward, backward, and up and down. Uh, and it's only more recently 
through some testing that we found out that um, whatever the original stylus was that was in the Meyer Day, the boy's hand, had very sensitive up and down uh, registration by the cams. Uh, so much like the Jacques Edro pieces and uh, the, the one um, called a Mojukaki, the Japanese uh, write-in automaton that uses a, uh, uh, an, an ink brush, it has very delicate in and out uh, pressure contact with the paper uh, that, that this piece is nobody really knew existed until more recently. Um, but sadly, over the years in its history, that original stylus that had that capability of touch, depth of touch, uh, was lost and was not retained with the piece. Uh, so that's yet to be discovered down the line. There are still historical details that are yet to be discovered about this automaton. Part of the clockwork motor that drives the cams. There's a fuse motor. Uh, that's where the barrel, the conical barrel with the chain is on. That is supposed to accommodate for uh, changes of speed as the spring winds down. Uh, so there's a constant RPM or constant speed to this piece. And the mainspring barrel just below the fuse, a very large brass barrel that has an extremely unusual helical cam, uh, which actually the cam shaft rides in and that controls the positioning of the huge stack of cams uh, via that helical uh, barrel cam on, mounted to a very large diameter barrel. Uh, very unusual mechanism, but extremely high accuracy rate on it. And then it moves into his predecessor, the Jacques Edro pieces, which are still uh, housed at the Historical Museum in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. Um, there's a draftsman uh, that I think is the figure to your left, then the musician, uh, which is right in the center. And she actually fingers the keyboard of a harmonium um, or a small organ uh, in, inside of that, that shell of a case in front of it. And then, the, of course, the writer is over on the right-hand side. Uh, three amazing automata from the late 1700s that uh, have survived. Um, there, were, there were others that existed um, by Vaucasson earlier, as well as the Jacques Hedreau pieces, um, but many of them have not survived history, the, you know, over the circumstances, over the decades, over the centuries. Uh, but luckily, these three are survivors, much like the Maillardet piece. An early depiction of them actually being shown, and this is actually you might think, well, uh, where were these pieces created? That um, this is Jacques Edreau standing, presenting his pieces to Louis XIV court. Um, and at this point, he's a relatively young man, uh, but looking quite mature. And you wonder, where were these pieces created? And it was back in Switzerland uh, at his home and workshop. And this is uh, an early uh, depiction of his, his home and residence and workshop. The lower, lower level is mainly all workshops. The second level had some workshops, some finishing shops in it. And the, uh, the balance of the second floor and the third floor was where the family lived. So it was all under one roof that these pieces by Jacques Hedreau were really made. And the automata were meant to draw huge amounts of attention. And of course, the ability to have exclusive showings to the kings, to the nobility, to the very, very rich and very affluent that were going to be his clients. And of course, Jacques Hedreau's main uh, merchandise were pocket watch, very high-end pocket watches, musical snuff boxes, uh, animated pieces, but much smaller than the writer, the musician, and the draftsman. Those were the calling cards that allowed him access into those, uh, those marketplaces, those uh, contacts, that high society. 
that then purchased all the other wares that his shop was creating. Very interesting history. Complicated in the three automatons, the writer uses a goose feather to form the downstrokes and upstrokes characteristic of the fine handwriting of a Neuchâtel lawyer. Jacques Hedreau used ingenious and consistently elegant constructions within an extremely limited volume. The word disc contains the letters of the sentence to be written and controls the cam cylinder. Three cams per letter, two to draw the letter and one to press with varying degrees of strength on the quill and execute the downstrokes and upstrokes. Two horological movements drive the letter disc and the cam cylinder. Tremendous precision is required to guide the movements of the heavy cylinder. Some of the 6,000 parts making up the writer, such as its mechanical memories, already provide a foretaste of the computer. I'll jump in here. Thank you, Jer. Well, you know, what, what's fascinating about the Jacques Edros figure is, right, all three of them, um, is that they contain all their mechanisms inside their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, I mean, the, the, the repertoire of the Maillardet figure is what it is because it has that enormous pedestal full of, full of so many cams that it takes four grown men to, to lift it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting to compare those figures and, and to understand also that they really did do what they appeared to do, that the harpsichord player really hits the keys with her fingers and the writer really dips his pen in the ink and, and, and writes the letters on the paper. I think, you know, in the period of the Enlightenment, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, was really the sort of the golden age of automata. And this is when probably the most complex figures were made in the most ambitious way to, to simulate life. Um, the, the one thing that I find most amazing and you touched on it was the fluid animation. It is so lifelike uh, and yeah. not jerky. It, yeah. It's very, very fluid and that's, that's only just recently been sort of, you might say, recaptured by uh, computer processing power um, through servo motors and everything today uh, for many, many, ever since these pieces were created, um, that was almost lost and things became much more mechanical and jerky motion in mm. the ro robots that were being created for the last almost century. Um, and that, that, that's where you're correct in this period of time, I feel, was right at a pinnacle of that fluid motion. Yes, yes. And, you know, and if we go back earlier, um, and I'm going to jump in here and show some automata from the Renaissance. Um, if we go back earlier, obviously we lose that kind of fluidity. But what we gain is a kind of first time ever in clockwork motion. Mm -hmm. and, and we also gain the chance to try and imagine what it must have been like to see a sculpture moving for the first time. Yeah. Um, and so I, I want to show you here, I'm showing you a little a mechanical friar. It's in the collection of the Smithsonian. Um, it was purchased um, through a Swiss broker in the 1970s. Um, it's either Spanish or South German. We're not sure. There's no signature on it. Um, and it was displayed for many years in what used to be the Museum of Science and Technology, um, now called the, the National Museum of American History, in the Great Hall of Timekeeping. It's about 15 inches tall. Um, and it was displayed without the cloak um, that it came with, the cassock that it came with. It's carved wood um, and a film was made of it shortly after it arrived at the Smithsonian. I wanna show you the film. It's, it's a funky film, but it's um, really, I think a wonderful chance to see what this thing does. Like the automata Jer showed it, it, it's wound and it's run by a spring. Um, the spring delivers power to a series of different cams and levers. The figure 
walks across a table. Um, it opens and closes its mouth. It um, beats its chest. It rolls its eyes and turns its head. And it walks towards one, turns, and then another, turns, and then another person, presumably seated at the table. In this arm here, it holds a cross, which it raises and lowers, and from time to time actually brings the cross to its mouth and kisses it. The illusion of walking is actually two stepping feet, but some hidden wheels that roll the, the piece through space. Um, the turn is accomplished by um, this little cam lifting one wheel, so the other wheel rolls around it as a pivot, the piece turns and walks in a new direction. Um, and it's, it's a, it's not a toy. It's a, an object of great mystery to us. Um, it's a piece I've been looking at for a long time and it's the subject of a book that I'm writing with David Todd, who was the conservator at that museum for 30 years and kept this automaton running. Here's a new video, a little more clinical, but it'll give you a chance just to get a quick glimpse of what this figure does. Um, this is made by Scott Nolly, who's the current conservator at the museum. And you can see that as the mouth opens and closes, from time to time, that left arm comes up a little higher and the shoulder is engaged as well. And the mouth makes a sort of a snapping kiss motion. So if you picture a tall cross in that hand, at this moment, the head bends, the kiss, and then it resumes its, its progress. A little bit of a look at the machinery inside of it. We date this piece by looking at the tool marks and character of the iron that the inner machine is made of. These are very typical of, of about 1560, about the middle or late 16th century. Um, this one has a fusee too. This is the mainspring barrel. The fusee is a fascinating invention that is a set of grooved, um, grooves carved into a cone that pull that spring in a way that equalizes its torque across time. And the mechanism by which the fusee works is, is complicated and brilliant. Um, you know from a child's wind-up toy that you wind it up and it moves really fast at first, then slower, then slower, then stops. The fusee connected with the mainspring gives us a chance to equalize that torque so that the piece works in a steady um, progression of activity. And this is a drawing by David Todd of the mainspring with the gut line wrapped around it and wrapped around the fusee. And um, the, the, the mathematics of the fusee is, is a, is an inc was an incredibly enabling moment in the history of clockwork, making clock, but also automata and mechanical things of all kinds, suddenly could be portable. They weren't dependent on weights um, and you could have a small piece that moved of its own. Here we are in David's shop in the basement of the museum um, years ago, looking at several automata, um, myself and David, and a visitor was there with an all wood Japanese tea serving automaton that was made a, a couple of centuries later, but based sort of on the same device as, as the early European ones. David did big clocks too in his years at the Smithsonian. Here he is adjusting the tower clock at the Smithsonian on the mall. Um, he and I together are writing a book about this monk, um, Mysticism and Machinery, a 16th century automaton and its legend was photographed by Rosamond Purcell. Here's a couple of her wonderful shots of this figure. Um, it's been beating its chest for 450 years. And so a little pad had to be placed so it wouldn't splinter its chest. And David made a model of it to display in the museum next to the original that viewers used to be able to wind themselves and watch it work. He made it a little bit bigger so there would never be any doubt about which one was the original. And the model is beautiful um, with a see-through acrylic body so that you can see, you know, the mechanism inside. 
here's the monk on view two years ago at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. There was a show called um, um, Science and um, Splendor at the Courts of Europe. And they borrowed the monk. They also borrowed the Maillard Day automaton. And they borrowed John Gong's model of the chess playing Turk, the famous model. And these were, these automata were sort of, for me anyway, the sort of penultimate piece de resistance in that show. Um, and you can go online. I should, I should have sent Maria the, the site for this show. And it was thrilling to see the monk there. They displayed the movie on the wall, projected on the wall behind it. Um, people were people were riveted by it. It came with a legend. It's thought that it might be a portrait of Diego de Alcala, a, um, a, a, a Spanish saint famous for effecting a number of miraculous cures, in this case, including the cure of the crown prince of Spain, Don Carlos, for which he was sainted, um, San Diego. And our book goes into this myth and tries to find out its source tries to trace it back. Is it really a portrait of Diego de Alcala? Um, and it's, it's a, that's a fascinating story as well. Here's an x-ray the museum made and you can see it's well made, you know, like here's, a, here's some iron pegs inside that wood. They really meant this to last. Um, and it's a really interesting duet between, between a, a clockmaker and a sculptor. Here's another x-ray of the inside of the head. You can see the movable eyes. You can see the joint for the jaw opening and closing. And here's David Todd's diagram of all the mechanical parts inside that head, including the little dotted line return springs that, that return the mouth to its closed position and the eyes, and the eyes to their center position. Um, I'm, I want to jump in and show you two more amazing figures that are about, made at about the same time as the monk. This again is about 15, sometime between 1560 and, and 1600. This is considered the golden age of clockwork. This is when clockmaking reached a pinnacle. Um, there were guilds and cities throughout, especially Germany, who specialized in clocks of all kinds and automata. This one is um, a figure at the Deutsches Museum. And um, we're not sure exactly what it does. Um, the Deutsches Museum has made some great photographs of it. You can see it's schematically similar to the Smithsonian monk. Um, it came missing its feet. And so the conservator there looked at the Smithsonian monk and guessed that perhaps maybe this one wore sandals too and had some new feet made for it. Um, Here's a few video clips of it moving. The hand was also missing, so a new hand was made. We don't know what these hands held. We don't know what they're doing. There's obviously something that it's working on, an instrument of some kind that would have been mounted at this bracket here. Um, it's a faster moving automaton than the Smithsonian monk, but like the monk, its mouth opens and closes, its eyes move, its head turns, um, it bows its head. And it went, on, it went on tour for a show and the back of the head came off and the conservator Thomas Rebeni asked his curator if he could leave it off and make videos of And Here you can see this offset crank for turning the eyes right and left in their sockets. You can see the return spring. And then right here, you can see the lever that opens and closes the mouth. And these are being pulled on by levers in the torso. Like the monk, it advances across a table, turning and moving in different directions as it goes, presumably to head towards a group of people, perhaps sitting at that table, each of whom gets a moment, a little moment of um, maybe dismay as the automaton comes at them. In a way, I kind of love not knowing what it's doing. I mean, the mystery of it is, you know, the mystery of it continues as we, as we watch it. This is a picture of Thomas Rebeni, who's the conservator at the Deutsches Museum, and um, oversaw the taking of the videos and the repair of it and the maintenance of it. He's, here he's showing a set of tests of different ways to remove ancient corrosion from cast iron in 
pursuit of the way that does the least damage to that original cast iron, because we want to see that iron, we want to see the tool marks. That helps us date these pieces and know um, when they were made. Well, Thomas, you know, Thomas is as, he's as charismatic as his automaton, a fantastic clockmaker. Um, here's a photograph that I took visiting that museum. This is one of the clock wheels inside that automaton, and you can see the layout lines from the clockmaker who hand calculated where each tooth was going to be and then hand cut that tooth with what we would call a hacksaw on a file. Um, these were not cut automatically, they were made by hand. Um, and the labor and skill is, is almost inconceivable to us now. Here's that same wheel in place, it's on the second arbor um, of the clockwork of that figure. And then I just want to finish with an extraordinary player, a, um, automaton about the same size, about this one's about 17 inches tall. This is in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And we think this is earlier than the other automata, maybe 1550, 1560. It's been in the collection since 1920s. Um, she walks along the table and strums the lute, turning her head. This is what the mechanism looks like inside. It's a little bit more primitive, but as you'll see in a moment, the motion is amazing. Um, as David and I were working on our book, Paulus Rayner, who is the current conservator and curator, I'm sorry, curator of the um, Kunstkammer in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, was sent a film of her working. She's no longer functional, but a film was made in 1936 of her in motion. So it's a legacy film. And he sent us a copy. And this is a bit of a premiere. This is the first time we've, we've this film has been seen. Um, it just arrived. It was, it was commissioned by a, a scholar at the Warburg Institute in London who wanted an idea of what the Milanese costumes on, on the courtiers in the 16th century looked like on a moving body. Um, so I'll show you this film. So this will finish our talk tonight. It's an old funky film. Every time I look at it, it blows me away. Um, and here we go. So you can see she's slowly advancing across the table. There's a little bit of residual motion. Her head movement is extraordinarily fluid. Her hands are like a hummingbird's wing. Um, film frames per minute can't keep track of the speed of those hands. You see her feet stepping out from, from the cloth of her robe. Like the others, she rolls along on hidden wheels and just appears to be walking. Um, this one can be set to walk in a, in a circle or a turn or walk in a straight line. Um, there's no actual music played, it's mimed, but she has a long train. She advances in a stately way across the table. Um, it must have been amazing to see it. One of the things we ask in our book is, what, what did viewers think when they saw these for the first time? In the Renaissance. These were these were very new kinds of objects, see. Um, fantastic. I think we'll stop here. Um, this seems like a good place to stop. I love those pieces. That's fantastic. Incredible, Elizabeth. Wait, I mean, truly, wait, what I'm so pleased that Paulus Rayner gave us permission to show this, and also so pleased, thanks to Thomas Rubeni at the Deutsches Museum for giving us permission to show. These aren't videos that are available. Um, they're, they're, it was, it's lovely to be able to, to have- Well, thank you to, for, to reveal them to us like this. Um, through all of your research, we feel so lucky that we get the behind the scenes tour of all these museums. Um, so, we have a question from the group, and if anybody wants to throw a couple more in the Q&A, we could take them. And this one says, what was the lighting and staging for automatons? Oh, that's a good question, actually. I mean, you know, just I'll just jump in and then give it to Jer. Mm -hmm. um, the automata I just showed would have been seen by candlelight or oil lamp, you know, maybe a little bit of daylight, but, you know, so factor that in to the magic of the performance, that it's, you know, that it's 
not the kind of clinical lighting that conservators now can, you know, can use to examine how they were made. Absolutely. Yeah. What do, do you think that there would have been, I mean, I know the music, the, probably the magicians would have had special staging as well, but do we know in the home if there was any special lighting? Because it's interesting, I've been thinking about how these are multi-sensory objects, how there was you know, the visual component and the audio component, there's the textural component, you had to wind them, so there was like, you know, a tactile quality and then even olfactory sometimes with ones that smoke and things like that. Um, was there a lighting consideration? Oh, um, back in the day, I don't, you know, in the um, 1500, 1600s, uh, I don't think uh, there really was. <laughs> um, I, I mean, a, a few of the pieces, some some like at the Metropolitan Museum or, or others, the Metropolitan didn't exhibit uh, what was it, Making Marvels uh, a few years back. And uh, the European Decorative Arts Department with Wolf, Wolfram uh, Cope. And uh, that, that had a, a number of really beautiful instruments in it and objects. Um, one of them was one of their own pieces, a uh, compound musical clock with automata of the Comedy dell'arte figures up top uh, revolving and dancing, all in original costume. And it had mirrors uh, in that cupola where those figures danced. And you could you know, um, swing the side mirrors out so when you were down at the right level in enough light, it looked like a ballroom and it, it um, amplified the number of moving figures that you would visually mm -hmm. see. A fantastic piece. Uh, and it's still in their collection and operating. I think they have a YouTube of it and it's about 16, 1625, 1620, 1625, uh, made in Augsburg, Germany. A fantastic piece, but it, um, other ones were meant to actually cruise the table at, say, a banquet and be center table pieces that would be a surprise. And I think the owners at that time of those objects, when they were sharing them with their guests, uh, it really wanted to show a certain um, power, knowledge, uh, in, uh, a wherewithal that mm -hmm. those owners of those objects had and they were willing to share at that time with their, their visitors. Um, the lighting in a large room at that period of time would have been candlelight, oil lamp. Um, it would have been flickering. It would have added that little magical touch, uh, you might say, especially in the evening, um, that added to the, the wizardry that the, the guests were about to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, oh, sorry. I want to get Maria, I can't do it now, but I want to get Maria the website of Making Marvels because that was an amazing show, Science and Splendor. Oh, we'll look it up and we'll put it in the chat. I'm sure that Maria's already on that. <laughs> really great side videos and clips of some of the some of the automaton objects that were in the show. Curated if you guys haven't already noticed, yeah, in the chat, there's links to all, all of these things. And in a follow-up email, we'll send the links as well. So great. don't feel like if, if you miss it now, don't worry, we'll, we'll send a follow-up as well. We have one more question here. What is the current state of this as a modern art form? And where would one go to study such if interested? Is it an MFA? How, how does one nowadays get into this kind of thing? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. We, we just opened at the Morris Museum our fourth kinetic uh, cache, cache of kinetic art in contemporary. One of the questions we usually got uh, over the decades with the, the Guinness collection at the live demos was, is anybody doing anything similar today to these antique, these 100, 200 year old automata um, that were represented and are represented in the Guinness collection? And of course, being here at the museum, we started to learn about contemporary artists because they're coming to reference some of the antique pieces and what they do, how they do, what they do. And uh, so we started a, a cache of kinetic uh, exhibit, and we only just opened the fourth in the series of cache of kinetic uh, timeless movements. We have uh, 35 artworks by a contemporary international array of uh, contemporary kinetic artists. Um, and and it, it's a, another fabulous, a lot of them, most of them are interactive in one way or another. Uh, we've just put a video, um, I think our, our marketing department has only just put 
a video together. I'm not sure if I have, I sent the link to that or not, but um, I'm sure that uh, will be searchable very shortly. Uh, uh, but that, that exhibit will um, be our website. You can go to the website link to the Morris Museum and Cache of Kinetic exhibit, and um, it'll be up for about six months. And we also have a Tomata convention, a Tomata Con, um, that is host, we're hosting for the third time um, in May, May 20th, 21st, and 22nd. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day Saturday, Sunday programming and exhibitions of contemporary pieces that are being made today and out there, as well as programming of who's doing what, how to, um, if for those that uh, just want to start a little project in the garage. <laughs> That's great. And all of this, if you're curious, is in the, um, it's in the chat. So if people are following along, and you can even register right there. Yep. Cool. Um, well, gosh, Chair and Elizabeth, this has just been so wonderful. Thank you for your generosity. It's been so fun to be a passenger this evening um, to learn so much more. And one thing I was thinking about a lot as I was listening to um, Elizabeth talk about the monk is how it was this be beautiful collaboration between a sculptor and a clockmaker. And I just wonder if there might eventually be a collaboration between you two. <laughs> I, could, I could see it. I could see it. I'm just putting it out there. Um, I know it would be incredible. Love it. Well, love the idea. Right? What is, I, mean, the month. I just love doing this with him tonight. You know, it was fantastic <laughs> just to chat with Jared and listen. I learned things I didn't know about my R day figure, and it's lovely to see him in his shop. So yeah. thank you for inviting us and Chair, thank you for putting up with me. And it was really, oh, really it, fun to put this together it, with you. Totally my pleasure. Really enjoyed being here. I thank you very much, Charlotte, for putting pulling everything together for this. Absolutely. It's just been such an honor to have you guys here. And I have a final image to share um, for both of you. <laughs> if you're curious, <laughs> if you want to see what could be the monk in the future, it's an exquisite corpse. But um, these are two pieces in the Barry Art Museum permanent collections by Elizabeth and Cher. And maybe someday we could figure out how they could all come together into their own new piece. So thank you <laughs> and have a wonderful evening. <laughs> thank you. I have a couple other shameless um, announcements before we all go. We have a really fun program tomorrow night if anybody lives in the area. Um, it's our Unite, it's our after hours programming. It's free to the public, live jazz, um, exciting local food and a really cool theater performance. Um, we always have tours on Saturdays. We've just started afternoon tea um, in April from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. right after the tour. Um, our next virtual lecture for all of you is The Birth of the Japanese Doll with um, Alan Scott Pate, who's an incredible uh, scholar. And we have an exhibit up right now that shows that. So we also have a Unite that will be going along with that. Um, and Please consider becoming a museum member. Uh, your membership supports all of these free programs. And don't forget about Atama Tuesdays. Every Tuesday on um, Instagram Live, we wind up one of the automata in our collection for you live and show you how it works. And my last little shameless thing I'm gonna do here is whirl you super duper fast through the 3D tour of the Motion Emotion show. You can come yourself, you can see all of these automata, you can see this video working, showing how every single one of the automata in our collection uh, move. And you gotta come to see Elizabeth King's work in person. Um, so please, we hope that you'll come and you'll see the show and um, experience all of this work yourself. And if you can't make it in person, check out the 3D tour. Thank you everybody for coming and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye now.